Good morning. Wonderful to see you all this morning. I have a question for you. <clears throat> Are you a contented person? Are you a contented person? Yesterday morning, one of the songs that Josh Philpot led us in in worship was the 1862 hymn titled, He Leadeth Me, which was written by J.H. Gilmore. Gilmore lived from 1834 to 1918. And among the lyrics of that hymn were these words. Lord, I would place my hand in thine, nor ever murmur, nor repine. Content whatever lot I see, since tis my God that leadeth me. Content whatever lot I see, since tis my God that leadeth me. Content whatever lot I see, since tis my God that leadeth me. See, if you were here yesterday, I want to know, did you sing those words? And if your answer to that question was yes, I have another question for you. Did you actually mean those words when you sang them? In 1985, the band Prince and the Revolution released their critically acclaimed album titled Around the World in a Day. That album included two top ten songs, Raspberry Beret, which peaked at number two, and Pop Life, which reached number seven. And though the somewhat whimsical Raspberry Beret was the album's most successful song, the song Pop Life was my personal favorite from that album, in part because it poses some very weighty questions that warrant our thoughtful considerations as Christians. The lyrics read as follows. What's the matter with your life? Is the economy bringing you down? Is the mailman messing you around? Did you put your million dollar check in someone else's box? Tell me, what's the matter with your world? Was it a boy when you wanted a girl? Don't you know straight hair ain't got no curl? <laughs> but life, it ain't real funky unless it's got that pop. Dig it, pop life. Everybody needs a thrill. Pop life. We all want a space to fill. Pop life, everybody wants to be on top, but life, it ain't real funky unless it's got that pop. You see, fundamentally, pop life is a song about contentment, or perhaps better, discontentment with the state of one's life in the world. It is a song that confronts us about the things we desire in this life and our responses to those desires, especially when those desires go unmet is a sad reality today that many Christians, despite the fact that their sins have been forever forgiven by God and that they are no longer under God's divine wrath, are so discontent with their life. For any number of reasons, they are emotionally, spiritually, and in many instances, mentally and psychologically jaundiced from a sense that their life lacks that pop, that something, that person, that possession, that experience which they've convinced themselves will provide them with a degree of fulfillment, significance, happiness, and satisfaction that they've longed for but have yet to discover. A biblical example of this is Samson in Judges chapter 14, verses 1 through 4. In the New American Standard Translation, that passage reads as follows. Then Samson went down to Timnah and saw a woman in Timnah one of the daughters of the Philistines. So he came back and told his father and mother, I saw a woman in Timnah, one of the daughters of the Philistines. Now, therefore, get her for me as a wife. Then his father and his mother said to him, is there no woman among the daughters of your relatives 
or among all of our people that you go to take a wife from the uncircumcised Philistines? But Samson said to his father, get her for me, for she looks good to me. Now, it's important to note the significance of that little three-letter word, saw, which appears twice in the passage that I just read in Judges 14. In the original Hebrew, that word saw is not speaking merely of what Samson observed visually with his physical eyes, but has to do with Samson allowing what he observed with his physical eyes to develop into a sinful desire in his heart. You see, the point I'm making here is that biblically speaking, it is possible to see not only with your eyes, but also, and perhaps more importantly, with your heart. Samson saw with both his eyes and his heart. And it's with that reality in mind that I want to ask you, my dear brother and sister, this morning, as you sit there under the sound of my voice, is there something of this world that looks good to you? Something of this world that you know in your heart is completely outside the will of God, but that you are nonetheless willingly, if not rebelliously, pursuing because you think it will give your life that pop. Samson knew very well the prohibition God had established against intermarrying with the Philistines. We see this in Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 1 through 3. When the Lord your God brings you into the land where you are entering to possess it and clears away many nations before you, the Hittites and the Girgashites and the Amorites and the Canaanites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites, seven nations greater and stronger than you. And when the Lord your God delivers them before you and you defeat them, then you shall utterly destroy them. You shall make no covenant with them and show no favor to them. Furthermore, you shall not enter marry with them. You shall not give your daughters to their sons, and you shall not take their daughters for your sons. What was it with Samson that you shall not, he didn't understand? I don't need to exegete that. You shall not. But you see, Samson's problem was that he wanted that pop. He wanted that one thing that he thought was missing in his life, that one thing that would gratify and satiate him regardless of the cost. It's the pursuit of the pop life, which not unlike Samson has led many professing Christians today into situations and circumstances of deep and sorrowful regret. In their misguided zeal to appease, to mollify, and to assuage their feelings that their life ain't real funky. They end up engaging in sins they thought they would never commit. And as a result, reaping devastating consequences that they thought they would never sow. Perhaps it was Samson who the Puritan William Ames, who lived from 1576 to 1633, had in mind when he said this. Quote, as in pride, men refuse to submit themselves to the will of God. So in taking counsel, which is not of God, they seek other gods, as it were, to whom they may be subject. Let us all examine ourselves this morning and ask God to show us if, in fact, we are not one of those people of whom Ames is speaking Someone who, in taking counsel which is not of God, seeks other gods to whom we may be subject. The 19th century English theologian J.C. Ryle, who lived from 1816 to 1900, said this. He said, when Alexander the Great visited the Greek philosopher Diogenes, he asked him if there was anything that he wanted or that he could give him. Diogenes gave Alexander this short reply. He said, I want nothing but that you should stand from between me and the sun. J.C. Rob went on to say this. He said, let the spirit of that answer run through our religion. One thing there is which should never satisfy and content us, and that is 
anything that stands between our souls and Christ. You see, ultimately, what Ryle is pointing to us in that account of Alexander and Diogenes is our affections. Phil Johnson touched on this last night in his exposition of Psalm 128. At its most fundamental level, discontentment is rooted in misplaced affections. And our affections, for better or worse, are always a matter of the heart. It was Jesus himself who said in Matthew 6, 21, for where your treasure is, there is your heart also. So my question to you this morning is, where is your treasure? Where are your affections? They're somewhere. Perhaps a better question would be, what are your affections? You see, because to answer the what is to answer the where. The 19th century Baptist preacher Charles Haddon Spurgeon said, quote, those things which we allow to take the chief place in our bosoms have the most power to give us grief, unquote. Conversely, the 17th century Puritan theologian William Greenhill, who lived from 1591 to 1671, in his book titled Stop Loving the World, said this, quote, If we are to stop loving the world, let us look much at the other world. There is another world. There is a world to come, and that world is a better world than this world. If we are to get our hearts off of this world, which is a very necessary thing, then we must guard our hearts with all diligence. Look as attentively to your hearts as to your eyes, as to the food you eat, to your entire life. Keep your heart with all diligence. Look to your affections. Listen to this. Look to your affections and do not let them rove and wander up and down in the world, ranging from here to there. Some of you are guilty of that. You're letting your affections just wander and rove from here to there. Which is why you're discontent. The Apostle Paul writes in Colossians 3 verses 1 through 1 and 2. He says, therefore, if you've been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind, that is fix your mind. Set your mind so that it doesn't waver, so it doesn't rove about to and fro. Fix your mind on things above, not on the things that are on earth. You see, the discontented Christian reverses that order and fixes their mind on the things of earth rather than the things of God. Though you and I may not think of discontentment in light of such sins as lying, adultery, or murder, discontentment is sin. It is sin because it's evidence that we treasure something or someone more than we treasure Christ. To be discontent is to, is to pridefully declare to the God whom you profess to believe in, who paid your sin debt on the cross, sorry, Lord, but you're not enough. I need more. That's essentially what you're saying, attitudinally speaking. The 17th century Puritan John Flavel, in his book titled Keeping the Heart, said this, quote, It would much conduce to the settlement of your heart to consider that by fretting and discontentedness, you do yourselves more injury than all the afflictions you lie under could do. Your own discontentedness is that which arms your troubles with a sting. It is you who make your burden heavy by struggling under it. Could you but lie quiet under the hand of God, your condition would be much easier and sweeter than it is, unquote. It is the height of arrogance and pride for any professing believer in Jesus Christ to refer to him as Lord and yet somehow regard him as insufficient to satisfy them solely on the basis that their life ain't got that pop. I mean, consider the audaci audaciousness of that kind of self-centered mindset in light of these words from the Puritan Thomas Watson, 
who lived from 1620 to 1686, who in his book titled The Art of Divine Contentment said this, quote, Listen closely to this, please. In a word, a contented Christian being sweetly captivated under the authority of the word of God desires to be wholly at God's disposal and is willing to live in that sphere and climate where God has set him. Do those words describe you this morning? Can you honestly say, with Watson, that you are willing to live in that sphere and climate where God has sent you. It's an important question to consider because the sin of discontentment, and hear me clearly on this, the sin of discontentment is an attitudinal gateway drug to other sins. Discontentment is such a destructive sin that if it's left undressed, it, unaddressed, rather, it can and will decimate everything in its path, including your relationships with other people. When you really think about it, a discontented Christian is a living, breathing oxymoron. Another word for discontentment is thanklessness. I say that in light of 1 Thessalonians 5.18, which says, In everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Along those same lines, the Apostle Peter declares in 2 Peter 1.3 that his divine, that is God's divine power, has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. Now, the word everything in the two aforementioned verses it is the Greek adjective pas, P-A-S, which translated means all, each, any, the whole, and all things of all types. So in other words, when you look at 1 Thessalonians 5.18, 2 Peter 1.3, the professing believer in Jesus Christ is to be genuinely thankful to God for all things literally, without exception. To be a Christian is to turn one's back to the world and away from the things of the world toward the things of God. To again quote Thomas Watson from The Art of Divine Contentment, quote, discontentment takes the heart wholly off from God and fixes it on the present trouble so that a man's mind is not upon his prayer but upon his cross, unquote. I wonder, is that you this morning? Have you allowed the thing that you're discontent about to so affect you that instead of taking that matter to God in prayer, you've chosen to complain to him about it? That's what Watson means. When he says discontentment takes the mind, moves the mind not upon his prayer, but upon his cross, upon his burden, upon that thing that he's complaining about, that he's discontent about. Ponder what Watson just said against the backdrop of these words from the Puritan Jeremiah Burroughs, who lived from 1599 to 1646, and who in his book, Contentment, Prosperity, and God's Glory, said this. Quote, Burroughs said, the wheels of a good watch will stay in constant and steady motion, even if a man sits on it or if it is dropped or thrown around. So it is with the heart of a man. If there is grace within and the wheels work rightly, grace will keep the heart steadfast. Let, con- let the condition be as various as possible, whether tossed up or down, this way or that way, the heart will stay the same. So in a constant way, whether in prosperity or adversity, the gracious man will still respond consistently before God. If God brings illness upon him, he rejoices in God and blesses him. You will find pleasant and spiritual things coming from him even then. And if God delivers him and he comes into prosperity, there you will find that his heart still remains heavenly. It remains gracious, spiritual, and raised above created things no matter what condition he is put into. 
One of my favorite verses in the entire Bible is Ecclesiastes 7.14. If you don't have that verse highlighted or underlined, I would encourage you to do it. Ecclesiastes 7.14 in the NESB reads, In the day of prosperity, be happy. But in the day of adversity, consider that the Lord has made the one as well as the other. That is a one-verse theology against discontent. One verse. I mention that verse because I sincerely believe that if you would only accept the truth of that verse, particularly as it relates to the sovereignty of God over everything that occurs in your life, you will never, ever have a bad day. God has made the one as well as the other. You see, the cure for discontentment is gratitude. Charles Spurgeon said, so long as we are receivers of mercy, we must be givers of thanks. Amen. Consider those words from Spurgeon in light of what we see in Lamentations chapter 3, verse 39, which reads, why should any man offer complaint in view of his sins? I could stop the sermon right there. You see, in other words, in view of the sins that you and I have committed against the holy God, we have absolutely nothing to be content about. Absolutely nothing. Nothing. So tell me, my friend, as you sit there this morning, what's the matter with your life? Is the economy bringing you down? Is the mailman messing you around? Did you put your million dollar check in someone else's box? What's the matter with your world? Was it a boy and you wanted a girl? Don't you know straight hair ain't got no curl? You see, you can feel free to replace those lyrical grievances, whatever it is you're complaining to God about this morning. John Flavel, in his book titled Christ Altogether Lovely, said this. He said, esteem nothing lovely except as it is enjoyed in Christ or used for the sake of Christ. Love nothing for itself. Love nothing separate from Jesus Christ. You've been hearing that constantly this weekend. Love nothing separate from Jesus Christ. In two things, we all sin in love of created things. We sin in the excess of our affections, loving them above the proper value of mere created things. We also sin in the inordinacy of our affections. That is to say, we give our love for created things a priority they should never have, unquote. The Apostle Paul writes in 1 Timothy 6, verses 6 through 8, But godliness actually is a means of great gain when accompanied by contentment. For we have brought nothing into this world, so we cannot take anything out of it either. If we have food and covering, with these we shall be content. In the Greek, that work, the way that word content translates, you can actually read that, that, that last sentence in verse 8. If we have food and covering, with these we shall be satisfied. In Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, we read of a man who endeavored to live the pop life. But he ended up lamenting to himself, come now, I will test you with pleasure, so enjoy yourself. And behold, it too was futility. I said of laughter, it is madness and of pleasure. What does it accomplish? In Hebrews 13, 5, We're commanded to make sure that your character is free from the love of money, being content, being satisfied with what you have. And in his commentary on Hebrews 13, 5, the noted Bible expositor Matthew Henry said this. Listen to this first sentence. Having treasures in heaven, Colossians 3, setting your mind on things above, having treasures in heaven, we may be content with mean things here. 
I love that. Having treasures in heaven, we may be content with mean things here. Those who cannot be so would not be content though God were to raise their condition. Christians have reason to be contented with their present lot. The true believer shall have the gracious presence of God with him in life, at death, and forever. Men can do nothing against God, and God can make all that men do against his people to turn to their good. So again, what in the world do you have to be content, discontent about? Now, as I prepare to close, I want to ask your indulgence and please give me your attention as I read these lyrics from one of my favorite hymns, especially as it relates to this issue of discontentment and dealing biblically with it. This hymn was written by the 17th century hymn writer Samuel Rodegast, and it's titled, What God Ordains is Always Good. What God Ordains is Always Good. And would you please bear with me? I want to read through the lyrics of this hymn. What God ordains is always good. His will is just and holy. As he directs my life for me, I follow meek and lowly. My God indeed in every need knows well how he will shield me. To him then I will yield me. To him then I will yield me. What God ordains is always good. He never will deceive me. He leaves me in his righteous way, and never will he leave me. I take content what he has sent. His hand that sends me sadness will turn my tears to gladness, will turn my tears to gladness. What God ordains is always good, though I the cup am drinking. Which savors now of bitterness, I take it without shrinking. For after grief... God gives relief, my heart with comfort filling, and all my sorrow stilling, and all my sorrow stilling. What God ordains is always good. This truth remains unshaken. Though sorrow, need, or death be mine, I shall not be forsaken. I fear no harm, for with his arm he will embrace and shield me, So to my God, I yield me. So to my God, I yield me. If you're a Christian here today who is harboring a hard attitude of discontentment, I humbly urge you to confess and repent of your sin and to plead with God to give you a new appreciation of the fact that in Jesus Christ, you have everything you will ever need to live a joyful and contented life. The Puritan John Owen, and I'll close with this, the Puritan John Owen put it this way in his book titled Communion with God. Owen said, Christ has brought that everlasting righteousness which will abundantly satisfy any hungry soul. After that hungry soul has gone to many a barren tree for food and found none. Christ is that tree of life which has produced everything that is necessary for eternal life. In Christ is the righteousness for which we hunger. In Christ is that water of life of which whoever drinks shall never thirst again. Amen. Thank you. Uh, It is my joy to be with you uh, this morning. Uh, We've had an amazing time uh, here uh, at this event, and um, I'm excited that we got to come back for the second time. So I'm shocked that, you know, after the first time, they let us come back. So we were were extremely excited about the opportunity. And it's with that that um, the task that I've been given uh, to speak to you about is one ambition, the gospel. One ambition, the gospel. Uh, If anybody knows me, I kind of cut my teeth doing street evangelism. Uh, And so it's with that that, man, you you give a guy who loves to evangelize a topic like the gospel, and we could be here for a while. 
but uh, Dr. Caldwell assured me that I only had about an hour and a half to work with, so I'll, <laughs> I'll do my best to contain things in that. No, he'll, he'll pull me here in about 40 minutes, so. And so with that said, I'm going to ask you to grab your Bibles, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and stand, if you will, for the reading of the Word of God. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 through 8. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 8. This is God's Word, and it reads this way. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, That Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. That he was buried and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. And that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James and then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared to me. Be seated, and if you would, join me in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for the truth of your word. My prayer would be that you would be with a humble speaker. Uh, help me to be clear in thought and mind. I pray, Lord God, for those who are, who are hearing, uh, that you would be with them as well, that you would draw their hearts unto yourself, that they would have clarity of thought and mind as well as we engage in the truth of your word. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Again, this is my assignment. One ambition, the gospel. The gospel. It's the good news. The word gospel appears some 93 times in the text of Scripture. Now, while the whole of Scripture can be said to be good news, the gospel of our salvation is the greatest message ever delivered to mankind. Somebody should have said amen. (laughs) Men and women have given their lives in the declaration of this truth. Jesus Christ would purchase this message with his life and then conquer death in order to ensure that the full receipt of this promise of eternal life would be experienced. Let me ask you this question. Is it your one ambition to deliver the gospel, as, as we've witnessed over the course of this past really decade or more, we recognize that there, there's, there's all kinds of gospels that are out there. There's all kinds of ideas about what good news is to those who are hearing it, particularly as it pertains to the culture. And, and when I speak about the good news that the culture uh, experiences or, or promotes, I'm not speaking of it in in the kind of way that you would probably consider, uh, especially here as of late, uh, as it pertains to the culture wars. For some, it's it's the gospel of self-help, the gospel of human determination. Sadly, when you listen to a lot of those stories, they're absolutely absent of the glory that God deserves. When I I think about that in particular, I think about a biography. There's a, a gentleman whose biography I, I read early and uh, got a chance to watch a, a movie based upon it. The, the movie debuted in 2006. It was called The Pursuit of Happiness. The Pursuit of Happiness. Uh, this was a biographical drama. I like biographies. I like to read real stories about real people rather than the fantasy land that Hollywood makes up. And this was a great movie. It was about a, a Will Smith uh, was a famous, I should say infamous actor now. He he and his son, Jaden Smith, were in the movie. They actually played uh, a story based upon a man by the name of Chris Gardner. We we follow the the, the storyline of Chris Gardner as he's in uh, a year-long battle for just self-sufficiency. For a year, he's actually homeless. Having invested his life savings into outdated scanners, he's, he's suffered numerous setbacks, including the theft of these scanners that he spent all of his money on. He's got a failing marriage, his inability to pay his rent, followed by the need to, 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 to have money to take care of his daily needs, the, the daycare for his son. His wife having left him, now he's alone trying to take care of his son. After looking for work, he takes a job with a, with a, a, a financial service company. The position that he takes on is unpaid. 
he is one of 20 interns trying to earn a position at this financial service company. The movie's high point ends with, with, with Chris walking into the office of the president and the vice president, trying to understand whether or not he's one of many people who's received this job, having experienced many ups and downs, backs and forths and setbacks all along the way. He, he walks in nervous, awaiting the final verdict to hear if he's received this position. As he, as he walks in, he's, he's listening, and uh, every word that's said, every, every, you know, every movement, every, every thought that, that, that is being, he's trying to perceive the thoughts of those who are in front of him. And he finally hears the good news that he's received the job. Ecstatic, because it, during this time, he had, he had spent time living in a, a shelter and time before that living in a, in a, in a bathroom with his, with his son just trying to make ends meet. This is good news for him. As, as he's in, impacted by this good news, he's excited so much so that emotion begins to fill his face. His, his eyes begin to swell, and he's r- trying to get out of the office, mainly in an effort not to, not to spill over with emotion. As he runs down the stairs and out the doorway, you notice he's in the city. And you hear the, 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 the cars buzzing back and forth, the, the honks of the taxi. You, you hear the, the, the builders of buildings and all of what's going on out there. But for just a moment, as he's walking, everything falls silent. And, and you see his face. And he's in tears. And he's, he's overcome with the joy of this good news that he's just received, he's, he can't believe it. He understands the, the change that this is going to have, the impact that this is going to have on, on him and his son and his family. He's incredibly excited, ecstatic. He races to the daycare where his son is, is at. And the daycare's named uh, is, is, what is the, the title, actually, of the movie. It's an, it's an incorrect spelling of the word happiness, H-A-P-P-Y-N-E. SS. Now, this story is a compelling tale of one man's journey to save himself from, from a tragic outcome. All of us are overwhelmed as we're caught up in the story as we witness this man's dogged determination to rescue himself and his son from what's sure to be a disastrous outcome. It's a wonderful story. It's a story, that, again, that speaks to our own determination to overcome our, our process, the, the, the situations that we find ourselves in. But here's the question. What do you do when there's nothing you can do? When there's absolutely no way out of your situation? When there's no ability for you to rescue yourself from the impending disaster? When you've tried and tried and there's no one else to call upon? What, what do you do in that given situation? These are nice little stories kind of compacted for us to witness and, and be excited about. But what do you do when you're in that situation? The Apostle Paul in his letter to the church at Ephesus explains our condition in this way and you were dead in trespasses and sins in which you once walked following the course of this world following the prince of the power of the air the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh carrying out the desires of our body and mind and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind Ephesians 2 1 and 3 a dire condition there is no hope there's nothing you can do but the beauty is that verse doesn't end there it goes on in verse 4 to say but God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he has loved us even when we were dead in our trespasses he made us alive together with Christ by grace you have been saved and seated with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus this is is good news. This news is much more than a job as a stockbroker. It's much more than a paycheck that puts food on the table. It's much more than the desire to provide for your family. This news should cause every one of us, every day of our lives, to walk into the streets where we live, to be overcome with emotion, for the distractions of the world to absolutely silence 
as our hearts are filled with the emotions of gratitude, tears streaming down our face in an, in an effort of, 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 of an expression of joy. Thank God for salvation. Thank God for the good news that he's given us. The question that I have to ask is, is this gospel your one ambition? Is the proclamation of this incredible message given to mankind, is that your one ambition? In the text that we read in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul explains the importance of this message. Take a look at it in verse 3. He says, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scripture, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scripture. The text of Scripture contains, this text of Scripture rather contains Paul's challenge, really. Uh, he's being challenged by false teachers. He's being challenged really on the, the resurrection of Christ in the context. Let me provide just a little bit of background and context for you here. False teachers who had made fun of Paul said he really wasn't much of an apostle. They actually wanted to destroy the, the faith of of believers, all in a selfish effort for their own approval, for their, their, own, their own personality. They wanted to draw men unto themselves. As you read Paul's full address in this particular chapter, you'll be struck by the combination of boldness alongside the demonstration of pastoral humility as displayed by Paul. You'll be impressed by Paul's powerful proclamation of the good news of the resurrection of Christ. But what also follows is the humble realization that he too is personally affected by this gospel. This Corinthian church to whom he writes this letter is, is one that provides a source of passion for him, great passion in that he, he loves them. He has great affection for them, but also they are the source of tremendous pain in Paul's life. Yet he pens this letter to this church. In this letter, he deals with the divisions, the quarrels brought about, brought about by the celebrity pastoral culture in Corinth. That may be hard for you to gather, but in 1 Corinthians 1.12, you have some followed Paul, others followed Apollos, others followed Cephas. They were vying for who, who's the teacher they would align themselves with. Paul addresses the sexual immorality of the culture. And then he explains the doctrines of family and how they should function. This, as, as, as you unpack the, the issues, the challenges, the things that are actually going on in this church, you come to find that they very much mirror how we live today. They very much mirror the issues and the challenges and the stresses of our own time and church culture in which we live. That shouldn't be a surprise. All of us are sinful. All of us are in, are in need of, of, the, of the message of the gospel. So as we examine this text, I want you to think about three things, three ways in which Paul unpacks the message of the gospel, three ways in which Paul unpacks the resurrection of Christ. Number one, the primary importance of the gospel, the primary importance of the gospel. Number two, he's going to unpack the propitiatory work of the resurrection, the propitiatory work of the resurrection. And third, the proclamation of the good news of the gospel. Let's begin with the primary importance of the gospel. 1 Corinthians 15, 3, 4, I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received. You can stop there. This section of scripture, the first part of this Scripture it can actually be divided into two compelling ideas. One, Paul says, I deliver to you as of first importance. This expresses the importance, the preeminence of the message of the gospel that Christ was raised from the dead. This message is of primary importance. Next, consider how Paul received this message. When you consider how, how did Paul receive this message? We, we know the story, the, the way that Paul uh, would encounter the resurrected Christ on the road to Damascus. So even in this one section, two primary things to think through. As you think about the importance of 
the gospel. I, I, my, my mind flooded through Paul's letters. How, how does Paul open his letters? How does, how does he ensure that, that perhaps those he hasn't encountered yet have, have understand the message of the gospel, understand the importance, the primary importance of the gospel? Well, Paul begins his letter to, to those in Rome where he had not yet traveled. He begins with the gospel of, the, of our salvation. Don't turn there, but just listen to me as I read to you from Romans chapter 1. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son, who was the descendant from David, according to the flesh, and was declared to be the son of God in power, according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. We have the life, the death. The resurrection of Jesus Christ within the first four verses of Romans chapter 1. In this same chapter, Paul says, I'm unashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first, then to the Greek. This is an amazing idea. He does the same thing in, uh, in the book of Ephesians as he writes to the church at Ephesus. We've got three Chapters of, of absolute doctrine. The first chapter actually unpacking salvation, the triune nature of our salvation. The fact that it is the plan of God the Father in eternity past, the purpose of the Son of God in time, and the perpetual safeguard of the Holy Spirit concerning and securing our future inheritance. However, when you open up the, the first this letter that we're in in 1 Corinthians, what you'll find is that after a brief greeting, Paul leaps into the issues at hand. There's a lot to deal with with this church. And so Paul begins to unpack, here are the issues, here are the challenges, here's what's going on. And for, for 14 chapters, he's addressing issues and laying out doctrine only in this 15th chapter to stop and say, I deliver to you that which was of first importance to identify what that means and looks like, looks like we have to go back to Acts chapter 18, verse 11, to find out that Paul actually in, came to Corinth preaching the message of the gospel and stayed there for a year and a half preaching and laboring and encountering those who would hear this message. This is an important message. It cost Paul greatly. He did this at a great cost to himself. Paul would leave that space and continue his work, never forgetting the primary importance of gospel proclamation, even to the point of being beaten and dealing with all kinds of issues and challenges along the way. We have the primary importance of the gospel, and then we know on the back end of that, how did Paul receive this gospel? You know that story well. If you've been at church for very long on the road to Damascus, he's, he's, he's going and he's hearing the, the resurrected Christ. Paul, Paul, why have you persecuted me? We consider the primary importance of the good news of the gospel. Let's consider the propitiatory work. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scripture, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scripture. Now, this passage has served as a guide for me, and I think for many. I was speaking to a brother uh, yesterday who was telling me that, man, he loves this section of Scripture. It's an opportunity to maybe teach people the gospel as a as a discipleship pastor, I always look for shorthanded ways to explain the gospel to someone. And this text of Scripture is incredibly helpful for that. I remember one time I was, I was at a Christian concert. I won't tell you the name of the artist, but was there and was with a number of young people. I remember walking up to each one of them time and time again and just saying, hey, I'm, I'm new here, just kind of figuring my way out and... Uh, can you tell me, I heard this was a Christian concert. I heard that people here know Christ. Can you tell me what I must do to be saved? 
Now, they figured out pretty quickly that I hadn't just stumbled upon this Christian concert. But that I was trying to get from them an idea of whether or not they could explain the message of the gospel. I think the other thing that gave me away was I, I had strapped to my chest, I had one of those cameras, so they, <laughs> they knew they were on candid camera, right? It's with that I, I asked the question, what must I do to be saved? Can you tell me in two minutes just what, what, what do I need to do to be saved? It was unbelievable because very few of them could actually tell me. Very few of them could actually articulate. They, they, were, they had their youth pastor there with them trying to coax them through the process. It was at that moment that I decided that none of the people that God gave me the chance to shepherd would ever lack an understanding of how to share the gospel. So I said to them, when we got back from that event, I sat all of the young adults, young people that I was there with down, and I said, Open up to 1 Corinthians 15, 3, read 4 and 5. So the gospel is the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sin. The gospel is the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sin. The gospel, it is the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. It is the gospel, the good news, that is the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins. I continued for at least a good 15 minutes to say the same phrase over and over and over and over again until they began to pick up on the fact that I wanted them to repeat with me that the gospel is the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sin. Now, in the same breath, I had to tell them that now, you don't just walk up to some stranger and go, life, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sin. <laughs> and walk away. But that these were, these were benchmarks. This was but an outline of a deeper conversation about the propitiatory work of Christ and salvation. The word propitiatory in the Greek is, is hilasterion, which means to atone for. But it's more, than, it's more than atonement. It's actually to appease, to expiate. It literally means to satisfy the wrath of God. This word is used to describe what took place on the Holy of Holies where the blood of an animal was spilled on the mercy seat on the Day of Atonement to cover for the people's sins for one more year until the Day of Atonement the next year. What God the Father did in the sending of His Son was He sent a sacrifice on our behalf as a payment once and for all for our sins against him. Understanding this propitiatory work of Christ should cause you and me and anybody who's been impacted by the finished work of Christ to rejoice. However, it's important that we keep in mind that what Paul is doing in this section of Scripture He's explaining the gospel in great detail, but it's in an effort to defend the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's very clear, 1 Corinthians 15, 12. Now, if Christ is proclaimed and as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there's no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. Verse 16. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. Why is this particular aspect, the resurrection, why is this particular aspect of the good news so important? It's because if Christ has not been raised, the law of God condemns us all. Many men have died for a cause. Religious leaders have, have made claims and, and, and have made uh, decisions to, to talk about who they follow and what they're about and, and, and promote different doctrine, but all of them are dead. There's only one who's been raised from the dead. There's one man who gave his life as a payment for sin, one who kept the law and commandments, one who is faultless. There's only one who who is blameless. There is only one who takes away the guilt. There's only one who is perfect, one who is 
holy. There's only one who is willing to exchange his righteousness for our unrighteousness. There's only one with whom the fullness of deity dwelt bodily. There's only one who was worthy. There was only one who bore the sins of the world. There's only one who came to this earth, wrapped himself in flesh, and died on a cross as a propitiation for our sin. Furthermore, there's only one who did all of that and raised himself from the dead. That is Jesus, the Christ. To God be the glory for what Christ has done. Paul says it this way in 1 Corinthians 15, 20. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. Praise be to God. Can we pause there for just a moment and take in the word of God? Christ has been raised from the dead. The first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man, for as by a man came death, by a man has has also by a man also has come also rather the resurrection of the dead. This is good news. This is good news. We've examined the following: the primary purpose of the gospel, the propitiatory work of the gospel. Let's look at the proclamation of the gospel. Verse 5, it begins by, and he appeared, he being Jesus, appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. And then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James and to, the, and to all the apostles. Last of all, as one untimely born, he also appeared to me. Here Paul is reflecting on the grace of God that he experienced. He experiences this as a rebel to Christ. Again, we're reflecting upon what Paul's conversion. How did he encounter this good news? How did he encounter the resurrection of Christ? Acts 9, verses 1 through 6. I'm going to ask you actually to turn there. I want you to see this. Acts chapter 9. It reads this way, but Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him. Falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Paul encounters the risen Christ. Praise be to God. As a result of this interaction, as a result of this intervention, as a result of, of, of Paul experiencing the incarnate Christ, the resurrected Christ, rather, as a result of this, Paul is forever changed. And he is able now in 1 Corinthians as he's writing to false teachers to, to make the proclamation, yes, this, this Jesus is indeed risen from the dead. He's, he's seen Cephas and he's seen the 12 and he's appeared to others. And as one untimely born, he's appeared to me. He's given a firsthand account of the reality. But as we're thinking about the proclamation of the gospel, as Paul encounters the resurrected Christ, let's take a look just down at verse 19 at what happens next. And taking food, he was strengthened. For some days he was with the disciples at Damascus. And ultimately, he proclaimed Jesus in the synagogue saying, he is the son of God. All who heard him were amazed and said, is this not the man who made havoc in Jerusalem? Of all those called, who called upon his name? Has he not come here for this purpose to bring them bound before the chief priests? But Saul increased all the more in strength and, was, and confounded the Jews who lived there in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Christ. <laughs> he can't help himself, he, he, he's overwhelmed. 
He's overwhelmed with, with emotion. He's overwhelmed with, with the goodness of God, with the grace of God, with the fact that, that God would intervene, intersect in his life and, and deliver to him a message like this, forever changing. It's from that point on that he proclaims the gospel. It's from that point on that he proclaims this good news. The life, the death the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sin. Let me ask you this question as I close. Are you like Paul? Is is this your one ambition? Is is there anything about the, the, the transition, the transformation that's happened in your life that causes you to stir when you even hear someone preaching or delivering the message of the gospel? Is, is your heart not filled with, 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 with joy, with, with gratitude as you hear from this pulpit or from wherever you may be the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ? And are you stirred enough to take that message out into the streets and engage others and tell them about this good news that you heard about the life, the death, the burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sin. My prayer would be that you would have one ambition. And that one ambition would be to proclaim the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let me close with a word of prayer. Father God, I thank you so much for your word. It is indeed true. We're grateful for the message of the gospel. We're grateful for the fact that your son came and lived a perfect life, died a death that he did not deserve on a Roman cross and that we, by repenting of sin and placing full faith in that finished work, can inherit eternal life. My prayer would be that anyone who's here who hasn't understood, apprehended, and brought into themselves that that truth that they would not leave this place before having made that decision and talking to someone. We're grateful Again, and look forward to the rest of this Lord's Day as we celebrate your goodness to us in song and in word. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.